chip seek. Um, so here there's some, some slides that goes through the, the chip seek protocol. In some ways, you start with the genomic DNA, and you enrich the genomic DNA for portions, regions of the DNA that bind to some um, uh, uh, protein that you're interested in, and you do that through chromatin immunoprecipitation. And then you subject the enriched DNA to sequencing. And what you actually get is some of the background DNA and then an overrepresentation of the regions that you pull down in the chip experiment. So you've got background DNA and then enriched DNA, and you're going to sequence both. And then you align the reads from the sequence to the reference genome. And in the regions of enriched DNA, you should get a pileup of reads, an excess of reads that you um, that represent the sequence that you'd enriched for. So you get this pile of reads around the places where the transcription factor or whatever regulatory element you're interested in came from. It's usually actually asymmetric because you you've got this uh, 300 nucleotide fragment that you've sequenced, and you and the 300 nucleotide fragment is from the pulled down region, um, and so on the on the plus strand you. On the plus strand, you've um, the fragments are sort of upstream of where the binding site is, and on the minus strand, they're downstream of where the binding site is. So you end up with a sort of asymmetric um, uh, peaks that represent the that are centered around the location where the transcription factor or whatever actually binds. Um, and so, in the experimental design wet lab phase, it's important to effectively enrich the genomic DNA ver via chip. So having um, a good chromat chromatin immun immunoprecipitation. Otherwise, you've got lots of background noise, and it's difficult to distinguish the peaks. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of sequencing, it actually turns out to be not particularly, you know, it's probably the easiest of the experiments in terms of least demanding of the experiments in terms of sequencing. You need to have reads that are just of moderate length. Um, they just need to map uh, uniquely to the genome. And um, and uh, and the reads are typically single end reads because um, you don't have any splice type of information that you need to extract. You just need you just have each of those fragments that you sequence is just a tag, and by a single end anchors it to some location on the genome. And having two fragments of that tag would just anchor it to the same location. So that second end of a paired end read is completely useless or probably probably that's overstating it nothing is completely useless it's not that helpful in a in a chip seek experiment so you're happy with moderate length um, and number of single end reads that's very adequate and you don't need a fancy aligner either you're not interested in splice sites they're not expecting to see splice sites in these experiments and so you're just looking for a basic aligner it doesn't even have to be splice aware the reduction phase, so you've got this, these, this results in these FASTQ files and BAM files with big data. And then the reduction phase is uh, you identify where these peaks are, so where you have reads that are above the background noise. And um, um, so it's a peak identification uh, process. And you can actually do that really in a really straightforward way in, in R and Bioconductor. Um, and you can do it in a really straightforward way in a, a busy and other um, um, software implementations. There seem to be a huge number of uh, chip seek peak callers. And uh, there are two views of that. Either there are bazillion ways in which you can call peaks and they're valid in, under different circumstances, which is partly true. You can have broad peaks or narrow peaks and the sort of different algorithms work better in different circumstances. Or maybe it's just really easy to call peaks. And so people have done, invented the, the real and in different ways. So um, many uh, different tools that depend on the application, but uh, one that's used uh, quite frequently is called MAX, and that has a kind of reasonable statistical model underlying it. So what it does is it scans the genome and looks for regions where there's an excess of reads within a, a sort of a sliding window um, compared to the local background with an um, underlying statistical model that describes what to expect. And at the end of the day, it says, well, at this region, I've got a peak. And it outputs data in one of two forms. It's either a, a so-called bed file, which is uh, basically like a G-range, but in, in text format. On this chromosome, there's a peak that starts here and ends here. 
And then the other format that these peak callers generate data is in a so-called wiggle file, which is like um, which is like the little histogram as you go across the chromosome and you sort of no peak, no peak, no peak, okay, and now I've got a peak that's sort of mound shaped like this that scans these this type of region. And wiggle is just a way of representing that data in a compact, compact way, you know, compressing all of those zeros and so on. So you end up with this um, these bed or wig files, which represent a huge that's the reduction of the data. That's our Julia child reducing uh, the, the, the sauce, the BAM sauce, into these beta wig files for, for consumption um, by uh, you and I. So then it comes time to, uh, to think about what analysis and comprehension, and there are some great tools in Bioconductor for working with these bed and wig files. The R track layer package imports bed and wig files to our favorite data structure, the genomic range. Hey! So um, um, in representing bed and wig files in these standard bioconductor packages that you can easily incorporate into your workflow, like asking, I've got these peaks that have been called by my peak caller, which genes are they near? That's like this fine, fine nearest uh, key range type of operation. Um, so we've got our track layer for inputting the data, chip QC for quality control, chip, chip peak anno and chip express for annotating peaks in relation to genes and other genomic features. That's a very common. Now I've got these regulatory marks. What genes are they associated with? What pathways are, are those genes in? Um, and then an interesting package is called diffbind. And the scenario here is um, that you've got samples from, say, two treatment groups, and you've done chip, chip, uh, chip seek experiments on each, each, on all of those samples. And just like with differential expression, you're asking, is there any evidence of differential binding of these, um, uh, at these um, genomic locations? So are there regulatory marks that are overly um, represented in this treatment group compared to another treatment group? So that's uh, diff-bind. And then I wanted to mention that annotation hub package, which um, um, uh, accesses, facilitates accessing some of the consortium level summary data that's been generated, like from the ENCODE project, which has generated um, <laughs> sort of hundreds of these bed files that represent the binding of particular uh, uh, regulatory elements in different cell lines. So they've got like a, a zoo of uh, bed files out there. And the Annotation Hub allows you to just reach out into the cyberspace and pull pull in the tracks that you're interested in as genomic ranges so that you might use the data in your own, uh, in your own workflow. So, it's the end of the chip, uh, chip seek uh, presentation.